you know, recently I've been uh, realizing more and more that the Bible, God's Word, is very, very, uh, it's very applicable in everyday life. It's very uh, useful. It's real. It's not some theory that we read, a book that, uh, that we read, that we read, find some kind of theory, and then we don't know how to apply it. It's very practical in, in our lives. The more we read God's Word, the more um, real it begins. It's, it's very, very practical. And if we begin to separate the Word of God and, or our gathering of the saints with the, what we call the real life, the Monday life, then it's, it's of no use. The scripture is given to, for every aspect of life, for every day of life. And when Jesus preached, he went out and preached to those who were tired, who were weary, those who worked, labored, to the shepherds who were despised. He, he preached to, to those in high positions. He preached to everybody and at every time. It's very practical. It's very applicable. And if, when we try to separate church service or the scripture with the real life that we call real life, then it's of no use. We ought to apply what we read into our every say, uh, everyday life. I remember one, uh, one day I was uh, spending time with the Lord. It was early in the morning. And um, at that point I worked as a project manager and I got a call early in the morning. There was some kind of issue at work. And here I am spending my time with the Lord. And I'm getting a call with a bunch of complaints and issues that I need to figure out. And after a long conversation, I go back into my prayer closet and I pray, Lord, take me maybe some, to some kind of island or something. I just want to spend time with you. I want to be alone with you. And here I have a bunch of these people that bother me when I'm spending my time with you. If you have to, Lord, take me to some kind of island. Just so that I can be alone with you. And at that point, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me. I don't need you on an island. Why would I need you on an island? I would have taken you home instead. I need you to be in the midst of problems, in the midst of the world, in the, in, in the midst of all the troubles all around. And I want you to be a light, a reflection of my glory. That's what I need you. So dear brothers and sisters, the word of God is applicable. And we ought to be the reflection of God's glory everywhere we go. We ought to apply this word of God. And as we live this life, he will teach us how to do that. And I believe that with the message that Holy Spirit has placed on my heart, um, we can apply for everyday life. If you can open again to um, Luke 10, verse 38. We will have it on the screen also so you can follow along. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, it's a very familiar story that we read. Uh, most of us know it, if not all. Um, for the last maybe seven, ten years that I've actually been uh, paying attention in the services. During the kids' dedication, I haven't, had, I haven't heard even one Martha. There's no kids named Martha. I don't know if you know them. I don't know even one Martha in my life. I know ma many Marys out there, but I don't know ma one Martha. If you know any, um, pray for them. They're not fully desired. Um, the name, and the other day I checked uh, the rating of that name, Martha, and it was number 771. And I thought there were probably 770 in total names, and it's the 71st. It's not a very desired name. Why? Because we know this characteristics that is described in this passage that, that we read, and nobody wants to be this person who is, even though lovingly, but rebuked by Christ. So nobody dares to name their child Martha. But this is a passage for us to get to know this passage and apply it into our lives. We need to get a little bit more on the context part and something that <clears throat> would be uh, beneficial for us, I believe. The context of the story in the beginning of the, of the passage that we read, it says that Jesus and his, his disciples were on their way. 
And when we take a look at Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it gives us an answer of where they were going, from where to where, from point A to point B. And it says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So at this point, we know that Jesus and his disciples were taking a journey towards Jerusalem. That was now his main focus. That was the direction that he was uh, taking. I remember when I was taking motorcycle classes and the instructor, instructors would teach us, you need to turn before you turn there, you need to turn and look your head towards the direction where you want to end up. You start looking that direction and then eventually your entire body begins to lead to that place and you'll end up there. You're not there yet, but you have to look into the place where you're going to be and that's where you'll end up. And this is what we see Jesus Christ, in a sense, he, he, he turned his entire body. This is now his last stretch of his ministry. He's now going to this and, and I believe even though before it says when John was put into prison, uh, John the Baptist, it says that he retreated, Christ retreated to Galilee. He was spending a lot of his ministry in the places of Galilee, in Capernaum, in all those areas. And now at this point, the time has come. That's his last stretch. And now he turned his entire journey is on a final stretch. He's going to Jerusalem. And I believe every person that he encounters going forward from this place, he tries to point them more than ever to Jerusalem and what will happen there. There's, a last, there's something that's going to happen that's going to mark the center of humanity, of the history. And he points people there. And I believe that every person that he's encountering ever since, although he did it before, he wants to make sure that they know, they look, they pre they're prepared to receive what he's about to do in this place. And he's on his last stretch. And on the way to Jerusalem, he stops by um, a village named Bethany. We're familiar with that name. Uh, and he, Martha opens up the door for him to her house. And he and his disciples, they enter in. And, you know, Jesus loved that place. In fact, Jesus loves every heart and every, every uh, house and every heart that would open their doors to him, to his presence. He loves to abide with those people. They might not be perfect, but he goes into that, uh, into that heart. It says that everybody comes to him, anybody that comes to him, and he does not reject Anybody that invites him, he does not uh, reject. And I was reading, as I'm reading through the Gospels, it says that Pharisee invited him, he went into his house. Somebody in the wedding place invited him, he goes to the wedding place. So everywhere he's invited, everywhere he's wanted, he goes in there. And today, if you desire to have him in your heart, he's, he desires to be there. He loves to be in a heart that desires his presence. And for the people that own that house, for the people that, you know, have that heart, it's their heart, it is an honor for Christ to be in their heart. It is an honor. The other day I was reading a, a statistics on uh, uh, believers and Christians who profess to be believers. And a uh, majority of the people, I don't know the exact percentage, the majority of the people are saying that in my life, I want to, de I desire, I want to honor God. It's an honoring thing to have Christ in, in your heart. And I want to honor God with my life. Now, whether we do or not, that's a deeper question, but people desire to, people want to. Now, this passage that we re read, the first character outside of uh, Christ and his disciples we see is Martha. And she's this person who is uh, very initiative. She says that Martha opened up um, the house for Christ. Now, Mary lived there and Lazarus lived there, but it was Martha. She took initiative. And we see that it wasn't the only thing that she took initiative. She began to serve Christ. He began to serve the disciples. And in this serving preparation, it means that she was waiting on tables. She was preparing food, preparing bread. She was doing something in order to serve Christ, in order to, to minister unto him. And she was doing necessary things. The Bible tells us that the, she was doing the preparations that needed to be made. Now at this point, we're not talking about her doing something that is sinful. I believe truly that if uh, a person has a sin that they love in their hearts, that Jesus is not really welcome there. I really believe that because G when Jesus said, when I send my spirit, who is the spirit of Christ, he, was come he will come to the world and he will convict the world of its sin. That was one of the first things that Holy Spirit does. He, he will convict the world. He will convict you and I. Uh, of the sin, if we have it and if we love it. We don't fight against it. We don't want to reject it, but we love it. We want to keep it. 
And I believe in that heart, Christ is not, rege- uh, is not welcomed. He's not desired. But at this point, we see that Martha is not doing sinful things. She's not busy partying and drinking and doing all these things. No, she's doing the necess- necessary things. She's doing the things that we ought to do. And the Bible teaches us that we have to do many different things in this world. We have to serve him. We have to serve his body, his people. We also have to go and work. We also have to do school. We also have to clean up around the house. We ought to be very wise and dedicated and, and, and given over to, to serving the people around us and doing all these things, to providing for our households. We have to do all these things. Those are necessary things. We have to do them. It can be regular life. It can be ministry. But it says at this point that Martha was distracted. She wasn't only doing those things, she was distracted by what what she was doing. And that word distracted means torn within, over-occupied, too busy or driven about. She was just torn within herself by doing so many things at the same time. And she comes to this point in her life, in in, you can say in her ministry, in her job, She comes to this point where she approaches Jesus and she says, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that my sister left me to do the work by myself? In everything that I'm doing, I feel like I'm alone. I'm serving you. I'm serving your people. I'm serving the disciples. But I'm doing this alone. Don't you see that my sister, Mary, she left me. There's no one to help me. Now, it's interesting that she approached approaches Jesus on this when we were little kids when we had a problem with our brothers and sisters we dare not to t- to uh, come up to our parents we would get a lot of spanking from the brothers or sisters if we had a problem with somebody we would come up to the people but it's interesting that at this point Martha having a problem with Mary not helping her she comes to Jesus and says Jesus why isn't my sister helping me she left me to be by myself I'm all alone in the, all this And you seeing all this, you don't do anything about it. I believe truly the reason why she approached Jesus is because maybe she felt at some point that even Christ himself abandoned her. I don't know if you felt that in your personal life, that whatever you might be doing, you might be doing daily lives, daily routines, work, you might be doing ministry, family life, but sometimes you might come to this point that you might feel like you're absolutely by yourself doing that. You're doing ministry, you're serving him, and there's nobody to assist you. You're, you're trying to provide for your family, and it feels like nobody really cares about you, and you come to Christ, and you say, Jesus, it's not only people are not helping me, but I feel like you even abandoned me. I feel alone. I feel by myself in all of this, and you're not doing anything about it. I'm fe- serving your church. I'm serving your people, but I feel like I'm alone. I believe this is not about the name Martha. It's about taking on what Martha took, the character. I believe there are a lot of people who act like Martha today, even believers. Although Christ is in the house, he's in the heart, and they are doing the things that are necessary, necessary, but they feel like they've been abandoned. They feel like they've been left to do things by themselves. There's no assistance, there's no help, A lot of people feel this way, even believers, they come to this point where they even reach a point of depression because they feel like nobody cares around them, even Christ himself. Although seeing all this does nothing about it. Some time ago, I was talking to a very dear person of mine and um, he was telling me about his situation in life that God already brought him out of. Uh, thankfully and he was telling me a story of himself he said you know Alex at one point in in life I was in such a place where I was doing everything that I had to do I was I was trying to provide for the family I was trying to do good as much as I could I, I, I was I thought I was going the right direction everything that I did but I came to this point where I felt completely by myself He said, I came to a point where everything was falling apart at work. Uh, You know, there was just no money. And he says, at one time I was standing in my garage. He had three kids. He has three kids. I was standing in my garage, he said, and I was weeping before God. 
I had no money. I had a negative on my bank, a bank account and I had no money to buy bread for my children. And he's a young guy and he said, and I was weeping before God in the prayer that I had towards God. that says, Lord, have you abandoned me? I don't know what I've done wrong, but I feel like you've abandoned me. Thank be to God, sometime after he prayed that prayer, he receives a call from another uh, person. And the person begins to just talk a little bit about them, themselves, about their life. And he said, you know, I uh, recently paid all my debt off and I'm good. And uh, I decided to do something. I just had it on my heart. Check your bank account. And this person that I was talking to, he said, I checked my bank account. There was, bank account, there was $1,400 in my bank account that this person randomly just sent. He said, I just felt it. Now with this, I believe truly that we need to understand is God sees all of these things. But we come to a point in our lives, in our ministries, in our families, in whatever situation we might be going through, it's that we come to a point that we might feel that we are by ourselves and although Christ sees all these things, he's not doing anything about it. Now, when I read at the response that Jesus had towards Martha, I'm amazed at that. Because he says, in, what, in his response, he says, Martha, I do see all these things. And I also see that you are worried and you're upset. You're worried, meaning uh, uh, you're stressed out. You're anxious about everything. You're worried. You, you're upset about many different things. By that, Jesus is saying, I see what you're going through. I see that you even feel like you're by yourself. I feel like you're, I see that you're feeling that you are alone. But I see even further than that. I see the things that probably you don't even see. I see deeper into your heart than you even know your heart. I see that you're worried. I see that you're upset. The amazing thing is that in John 11, 5, Jesus it says, it speaks about Christ. It says, Jesus loves, loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It's amazing that Mary, the good one that we read about here, is not even mentioned by name here. But it speaks that Jesus loves Martha. He loved Martha. And I believe in the passage that Jesus is saying, the response, it says, Martha, I love you and I see all these things. I love who you are. I love your dedication. I love your initiative. I love what you're doing. I love your desires. I see all this and I see your pain and I see that you're feeling lonely and alone in, in what you do. I know that you feel abandoned and I see further than what you even know of yourself. I see that you're upset. I see that you're worried of all this. But I want to give you something. I want to give you a word, Martha, a word that you don't hear at this point. Martha, you just don't hear the word yet. I believe that Christ in this passage is saying that I came to serve you first. I came into the house to serve you first before you serve me. In the Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 it says, Christ himself speaking, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. That's the first step opens the door. I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And I believe even in this passage, we see that Christ, as he comes into our hearts, first of all, what he desires to do before we even serve him, the first that he would minister unto us. What that means before I do things for God and even before I do the necessary things, before I do any of that stuff, we first have to come to a place where where he can give us a word, where he can minister unto us, he will fellowship with us first. And then we would fellowship with him. He says, Mary has chosen a better thing and it will not be taken away from her. Before you minister unto me and my people, I want to spend time with you. So fellowship with me, Martha. Come to my feet. Be at my feet. Hear my words. Because fellowshipping with me uh, reveals that you love me. I truly believe that we as believers, as those who accepted Christ into our lives, who opened the door of our hearts to let Christ in. I truly believe that the way we express the love towards Christ above all things 
that we come to his feet, that we come to hear a word from him. In Luke 11, 27 and 28, there's a, a, a story where Jesus is preaching. He's saying wise words and amazing words. He's expressing his heart, such powerful message that he's speaking to the people. And there is one woman that cries out and she says, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Blessed is the mother or the person that took care of you, who gave you birth, who nursed you, who, who protected you, who covered you when you were a child. But it is amazing to hear the response of, of Jesus. And he says, no, blessed are those who hear my word and obey it. In John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, obey my commands. To obey the commands, we need to hear the commands. And I believe truly the expression, number one expression of our love towards Christ is our ability to come to his feet and just listen. Just to spend time with him. Just to fellowship with, uh, fellowship with him before we do anything of the ministry. Before we do any of the necess necessary things. When I look at the story of Mary, the person that is desired by all of us to be in her place I look at her story and it also amazes me because shortly after this situation, after this story, comes a point where Mary goes into the room where Jesus is among others with an alabaster jar. And she breaks the alabaster jar, she pours the oil in it, the fragrance upon Jesus and on his feet. The one who was at his feet pours out the oil in the alabaster jar upon Christ and at his feet. Now, alabaster jar was a, it wasn't just some good perfume. It was something that a woman did, depended on. It was her present. It was her future. If there was nobody that would take care of her for some time, she would sell this alabaster jar, the oil and the expensive oil within, and she would use that money to support herself. In a sense, that was the future that she relied on. But the, when she, being at the feet of Jesus... There's something that happens there that makes a person comes back to Christ and pour out her present and her future before the feet of Jesus. By doing so, though, she did the actual thing that needed to be done. In John 12, 7, Jesus speaking of Mary, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. In Mark 14, 8, it says, She did what she could. She poured out perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. What Jesus is saying, it was intended to be done. My Father, from the beginning of creation, before the creation of, uh, of the world, has intended for me to come into the world to, be, to save it. And for me, in order to be saved, I had to come in order to be crucified. My body had to be prepared in order to, be go, to go on the cross. Now we have to remember that Jesus and his disciples were walking to Jerusalem. That was the entire intention of his journey at this point and maybe even the visit for Martha and Mary. And Mary, after being at his feet, comes back and she pours out herself by anointing him the bread that will be broken. Now she, Martha was doing all the needed things. There was a lot of preparations and she was literally waiting on tables and maybe preparing bread. But Mary, as she was at the feet of Jesus, being in the presence of God, hearing his word, taking in what he's saying, there's something that happens there where she does maybe one thing, but according to the will of God. She does one thing, but according to the will of God, because Jesus says, it was intended by my father, my body would be anointed the bread, the living bread that will be broken for all of us. And it says that Mary did this thing. It wasn't the many things that she was worried about. There's one thing that that amazes me. She broke the bread. She prepared the bread of life for breaking. Now I truly believe that those people who, who come and just sit at the feet of Jesus, fellowshipping with them. They just spend time with him and they're just there to hear from him. It's interesting that it doesn't say what Jesus was preaching when he was at the house of Martha and Mary. She was just there listening. She was just there trying to hear the heart of God. 
And there was something that she begins to, that just begins to happen within her heart that transforms what she does. She does one thing, but she does it according to the will of God. She does something that Jesus is saying, whatever the gospel will be preached, will be spoken about her. She did the important thing. I have a few friends in college that I'm really good friends with, but they're Muslims. They follow Islam. And as many days that we've been already back on campus, almost every day is back to the same conversation, what you believe in and what I believe in. As, as they talk about Islam and what they believe in and what they follow, what they can do, what they can't do, what they are doing in order to be pleasing to Allah and what I do. And the, one of the points, at one point, one of them said, you know, essentially, Alex, we believe pretty much the same thing. They're just very minor differences. You guys are doing what we're doing. You guys are not doing what we're not doing. That's pretty much sums it all together. We're pretty much believing the same thing. But we're just calling them different things. And I said, no, brother. We believe absolutely different things because the small differences that you're talking about is my entire foundation of faith. Because Christ, when he came down onto this earth, he is God. You don't believe it, but he is God. And he went onto the cross in order to die for my sins. He died for my sins. You don't believe he died, but that makes all the difference for me. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, if Christ didn't resurrect from the dead, assuming that he has died, if he didn't resurrect from the dead, my entire faith is futile. It's useless. It's pointless. It's not what I do. It's not what I follow. It's not the ministries that I serve in. It's not my everyday life, what I'm doing. It's not all of that. And it's not the, a small difference. It's the most important difference. It's the most important thing that I believe in. Christ died for me, resurrected for my justification. He did that for me. And I believe this passage even says something so important to us at this point. We can be doing a lot of things, but we can be doing in order to serve Christ, in order to serve His people based on what we try to achieve. But when we come to the place where we sit at His feet and we get to know His Word, just being in His presence, we get to know His Word, we come to an understanding that what I am doing goes off of what He's already done. Because Jesus came and He said, I'm going to Jerusalem and I want you to Look at it. Remember it. I'm on my way to Jerusalem. And you will serve. You will serve in ministries. You will do a lot of different things. But it will always have to go off of first me serving you. Me doing it for you. I am the bread who is broken for you. And after, you can break the other bread. I truly believe that. That's the most important thing that we need to understand in our service to God in our everyday life. As we come to him and as we sit at his feet, just being there in his presence. That's what we need to remember. You know what Jesus said? She chose something that will never be taken away from her. But it's interesting that Mary, after a short period of time, comes herself to Christ and she gives pretty much everything that she has. It's not taken away from her. She doesn't feel like it's taken away from her. She doesn't feel like she's wasting something. She just gives because she desires. It's not taken away from her. She dedicates it to Christ. She gives it up for him. And I see there's another thing. What Jesus is saying in that point. In being at the feet of Jesus. You come to a point getting to know his word, hearing from him, from him first, you come to a point that you realize that he's with you at all times. You realize that when Jesus went to the cross, he went into the cross and not only be, been rejected by his own disciples, not even talking about the rest of the Israelites, but he's been rejected by his disciples. And even in his prayer, he said, Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took on that title of being rejected. So that way when we're at his feet, we will never feel that way. And I truly believe that those people who come in just to get to know him, just to hear him, hear his voice, they will know 
<clears throat> that He is always with them and they will never feel like they're abandoned, even if they're doing everything by themselves, really. We see that Mary, when she came in, she poured out an alabaster jar. There was nobody that would support her except Christ. It says she was opposed because people said, you could have sold it and give it to the poor. But she knew that because she was at the feet of Jesus, she's acting according to the will of God. And let the entire world tell her that she's wrong. She's been at the feet of Jesus. I know some people ask me, um, Alex, how do you take on so many units? How do you take on so many ministries? And then you have work and all that stuff. And I don't boast in myself whatsoever. I'm a frail body, just like every one of us. But I've caught myself many times when I go into my prayer closet and I'm just at the feet of Jesus. And sometimes there's revelation that flows in and I sit there weeping before God or sometimes I'm just silent. But I caught myself so many times walking out of the prayer closet when being at the feet of Jesus, so energized, so ignited to serve Christ, going off of what He's done for me that I'm ready to take on another 10 ministries. Sign me up. By the wisdom of God, I don't sign up, but that's what He does. I truly believe that. Believers, Christians, children of God, those who allowed Jesus to be in their hearts, we can have Christ in our hearts and yet feel absolutely alone. Some people don't accept what we do and we feel abandoned. That we, we're just trying to do something better, but they don't want it. So I'm just alone and just trying to serve God. We can be supporting our families. We can be doing things and we can, knowing that Christ is with us, we can feel absolutely alone and abandoned. But I think the issue with that is what I believe maybe even Jesus wanted to tell Martha. It's not that I don't care. It's you don't hear. We need to come to a place where we're just at the feet of Jesus. Just listening. Just being with Him. Before we do anything else, before, before we try to do all the necessary things, before we do ministry, before we do work, before we do family time, before all of this, we come to the feet of Jesus. And out of that place, we come out knowing that I'm not alone. Although I can be in these tasks that I'm doing, Christ is with me. I'm never alone. He's with me. He's not abandoned me. He never will. He will take me through. And I know that I walk in the will of my Father because I've heard from Him in my prayer closet. If we can all stand up. In this time, I want to just remind you and I want to remind myself we can have these things. We can have Christ in our lives but feel miserable. We can have this. The Bible teaches us that. But it's not because Christ is not faithful. It's because we're not listening to what He says in His Word. And today I believe the Holy Spirit calls us to come back into a place where we just are with Him. We're just with Him. That's all that we are. We're at His feet. We're hearing from Him. We're listening to Him. And He teaches us His will. And today, I want to just remind all of us that we need to make sure that we have our prayer closet that is visited very often. And once we do that, we will not feel abandoned, we will not feel alone. But we'll continue doing what Christ has called us to do faithfully, knowing that He's with us. It's interesting that Mary Magdalene, it is believed that there were different Marys. Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Mary Magdalene, although there are some significances. It's interesting that on the day of the resurrection, she came to Garden of Gethsemane and all that she cared about is who took my Jesus and where did they lay him? Who took my Jesus and where did they lay him? I believe as we spend time with him, as we get to know Christ more and more, all that we begin to care about is if I have my Jesus, I have it all. And if there's something in our relationship that steps or gets in between us and Christ, it bothers us. We don't want anything else. We just want Christ and peace with Him and fellowship with Him. And if you have today something that's in between you and Christ, and you're saying today, who took my Jesus and where did they lay Him? He's here in this place. 
He's here. He's in your heart. You just need to let go of that sin. Say, Lord, forgive me for that. But I want to fellowship with you. And for every single one of us, let's be reminded of the prayer closet, the feet of Jesus, for us to be there, ignited, stirred to follow him, just to get to know his heart. And we will never, dear church, Bible promises us that we'll never ever feel alone if we are at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Let's just pray right now. We'll spend a few minutes in prayer. If you feel that maybe you are alone, if you need any help in prayer, you can come to the front. But let's all of us also say, Lord, today, I want to be drawn into your presence. When everybody is going for the Super Bowl party, I'm going into my prayer closet. Most important thing, Lord, is you. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place.